How did you create this summer season? I asked. Simple, he replied. We decided up front to be open and honest with each other, to never go to bed mad or harbor anger or resentment. We agreed to forgive, forget, and move forward in the love we have that is founded on the love of Christ. It was obvious to me that Jeremy and Ruth knew one of the secrets to continuing to live in the summer season of marriage. Why is communication so important? Because it is the process by which spouses get to know each other and learn to work together as a team. It is not always easy to make time for communication, but it is always possible. Jeanette and Sam have been married for 27 years. I am very content in my marriage, she said. We are looking forward to my husband's retiring from his present job and going into full-time ministry. We have had many good times, but we have also had many very hard times. But we both seek to find ways to encourage each other. The key to our marriage, as I see it, is that we have tried to spend time just talking. Sometimes we will take a walk, other times we will take a car ride so we can be alone to talk. We have five children, and my in-laws live with us. My daughter and her husband also live with us at the moment, but they have bought a house and will be moving out in a couple of months. Most of the time, we have to get out of the house so we can talk. Sometimes we have short conversations when he comes home from work. He finds me, wherever I am, and we talk about how the day has gone. It's that short communication time that keeps us feeling connected. Acceptance of differences. A second important action to maintain a summer marriage is granting each other the freedom to be different. Differences are inevitable, but they can also be very divisive. Couples who desire to continue in the summer season will consciously give each other the freedom to think, feel, and react differently. Lauren and Dean have been married for eight years. It is a second marriage for both of them. They both agreed that one of the things that has kept their marriage in the summer season is a positive attitude about differences. We accept each other's differences, Dean noted. This has been and will continue to be a learning and growing process for us. Both of us learned from our previous marriages that if couples don't accept differences, they will spend the bulk of their time fighting. We agreed that we would rather be lovers than fighters, so we give each other the freedom to be different. I met Vivian in Jefferson City, Missouri. She was 74 years old and had been married for 53 years. I feel very blessed to have a great marriage. We have our little ups and downs, but we love each other so much and feel so blessed to have each other. We have learned to overlook our shortcomings and focus on the positive things. We both feel that life is precious, and with the Lord's help we will make it together. We share our hurts and our joys. Recently, we experienced the tragic death of our son. But God is with us, and we are with each other. So we will make it. Learning to overlook your spouse's shortcomings is a key to keeping the flowers of a summer marriage blooming. Seminars and Books A third action step that is common among couples who describe their marriage as being in the summer season is attending marriage seminars and reading books on marriage. When I met Gary and Barb from Roanoke, Virginia, they had been married for 28 years and were definitely in the summer season of marriage. Barb said, I am content in knowing that my husband loves me and I love him. We have had trying times recently with our daughter's divorce, as she and our granddaughter have come to live with us. But our love and marriage have only grown stronger. The thing that I think has helped us the most is attending marriage seminars. Each year for the past seven years, we have attended the Fall Festival of Marriage sponsored by Lifeway Christian Resources. It has helped us tremendously. And, of course, what we are learning today from you simply adds to that. I would encourage couples to attend a marriage seminar every year. Samantha and Andrew have been married 17 years and live in Colorado Springs. Samantha describes her marriage as, summer with a bit of fall. She said, we've had some tough years. But about three years ago we took a class called His Needs, Her Needs at Our Church. Between that class and studying the book The Five Love Languages, I realized that by seeking to meet Andrew's needs and keeping his love tank full, I make it easier for him to meet my needs. But it took me 14 years to get to that point. And even now, if I am not willing to communicate my thoughts and feelings, things begin to fall apart. I know we need to keep learning. We've decided that from this point on, we're going to attend a marriage conference every year. I especially like the comment that Samantha made as she walked away. My mindset for life has been that I would rather attempt to do something and fail than to do nothing and succeed.
With that attitude and with their plans for positive action, Samantha and Andrew, I predict, will spend more of their time enjoying the flowers of summer in their marriage. Spiritual growth. Many couples have indicated to me that the most significant factor in their ability to have a summer marriage is that they have found ways to stimulate spiritual growth. Becca and John have been married for nine years. She said, it feels great to have confidence in someone who you know has the same goal you do in marriage. We have not always been in the summer season, but when we gave our marriage to God and allowed Him to work, things changed dramatically. We now know there is a greater purpose for us than having a great marriage, and that is to bring glory to God. It has brought an added dimension to our lives and our marriage. Van and Maria live in Auburn, Alabama, and have been married for 14 years. Van said, we are deeply religious, and we account most of the success of our marriage to that. The church has kept us connected as a couple. We have participated in small groups, both as a couple and as individuals. This has really helped keep us accountable. There is something about being involved with other Christians that stimulates positive actions between the two of us. I can't say enough about how God has used our church in our lives. Maria and I pray together. We both read the Bible individually and share with each other things we've read. We read Christian books together and we talk openly almost every day. We seek to do little things for each other that will enrich our lives. God has given us a genuine love for each other. I wouldn't exchange it for anything. Because God instituted marriage, it makes sense that couples who seek to learn from Him would have the best possible marriages. Research indicates that this is true. Point two. Staying in summer. Every marriage will have its summer seasons, but how can couples keep their marriage in summer? To answer this question, I'd like to introduce you to two couples one couple who have been married a short time, the other for longer. Notice the various elements of summer that they weave into their descriptions of their marriages and how they maintain them. Mick and Lucy live in Augusta, Georgia. Mick said, we dated for nearly four years before we married. We've been married now for five years. In those years, we have been through a lot. Moving across the country, searching for a new job, my parents divorcing after nearly 30 years of marriage, and many other things. These struggles helped to ground us in our own marriage. Through prayer, Bible study, our love for each other, and the support of Christian friends and family, we have worked our way through these challenges. We have odd date night, once a week, even if it's just sitting on the couch together, taking a walk, or going out for ice cream. No matter what, we make sure we show each other our love daily. We realize that as a couple we have to work on our marriage, and it's actually a lot of fun. Iris and George have been married for 38 years and live in northern Colorado. George described their marriage like this, we arrived at this season of marriage by fighting it out through the fall and winter seasons. Our early marriage was a bit of spring and that was fun, but this summer season is so much more joyful for us. We had to recommit continuously through our winters and falls. We made a decision early on that we would do whatever it took to work things out and move forward in our marriage, even though there were times when we didn't feel like it. Our strong sexual relationship helped keep us connected when our other communication was lacking. And I have to say that trusting in God, reading Christian books on marriage, and attending marriage seminars have helped us more than anything. Summer is an enjoyable season of marriage. The flowers are in full bloom. Sun-ripened fruits and vegetables are there to be enjoyed. Couples who want to remain in the summer season will take constructive actions, which grow out of positive attitudes and emotions. In summary, a summer marriage looks like this, the downside of summer. Before we leave our discussion of summer, I must warn you about the yellow jackets. Last summer, as I was pulling some weeds down by the creek, I apparently ventured too close to the door of an underground nest. Before I knew it, I was under attack by a battalion of yellow jackets. I ran for my life and they pursued. Before I reached the safety of the house, I'd been stung 14 times, which caused me intense pain for several hours. In a summer marriage, the yellow jackets are analogous to those unresolved conflicts that nest beneath the surface of our day-to-day -day lives. We might be in the summer season of marriage, enjoying life together, watching the flowers bloom, doing a bit of weeding around the edges of our relationship, but there's another, unseen, level in our relationship, an underground nest where we have pushed our unresolved issues. When one spouse or the other ventures too close to the door of the nest, the yellow jackets come flying out and we find ourselves arguing in the middle of summer. 
When we look at strategy 4, we will find practical ideas on how to get rid of the yellow jackets. For the moment, however, I simply want you to be aware that they exist and must be dealt with if you intend to continue living in the summer season of marriage. Summer is my favorite time of the year and my favorite season of marriage. Carolyn and I spend most of our time in the summer season, but it has not always been that way. In the early years of our marriage, we spent a significant amount of time in the coldness of winter, punctuated with a few short springs and many extended fall seasons. It took us a long time to get to summer. Perhaps that's why when we finally got there, we wanted to make our marriage an eternal summer. I can't say that we've reached that objective, but we do spend more time in Stunmer than in any of the other seasons. In any marriage, summer can easily move into fall, almost before the couple recognize it. Fall is not as traumatic as winter, but it is not nearly as pleasant as summer. In the next chapter, we will describe the fall season of a marriage. We'll look at the emotions, the attitudes, and the actions that lead a couple to conclude that, the leaves are falling off our marriage and the flowers have definitely wilted. In North Carolina and many other parts of the world, fall is the most colorful season of the year. The hills are painted with huge swatches of yellow, red, orange, and burgundy. Botanists can explain the natural causes of this sudden change of color, but most people simply enjoy it as nature's work of art. Thousands of people will drive to the mountains of western North Carolina during the fall season simply to see the leaves. What we do not talk about, but know without a doubt, is that this display of color is temporary. Soon the chilling winds will rip the vibrant canvas apart and the leaves will fall to the ground, leaving the trees bare. One interesting phenomenon is that the leaves do not all fall on the same day, but over a period of four to six weeks, the beauty fades and the forest is left unclothed. No one drives to the mountains to see a naked tree. The falling of the leaves is an apt analogy of what happens in the fall season of marriage. In early fall, the marriage looks fine externally. Outsiders may even comment on how happy the couple seem to be. But inside the marriage, things are changing. And when the chilling winds arrive, the deterioration of the marriage will be obvious to all. Fall becomes the prelude to winter. As with the other seasons of marriage, fall has its own set of emotions, attitudes, and actions. The emotions of fall. The emotions of fall include feelings of sadness, apprehension, and rejection, sometimes accompanied by a feeling of being emotionally depleted. Couples in the fall season are aware that things aren't right, though they may or may not be expressing these feelings to each other. But they are troubled by the state of their relationship. Marge is 53 and has been married for 32 years. Listen to the emotional words she uses as she describes her marriage as being in the fall season. I feel a lot of insecurity about my marriage. My husband doesn't seem to be aware of what is going on, but I am very unhappy. We had put the children, Rick's job, and others above each other. Consequently, now that the children are gone, it seems like we are slipping apart. It's very scary, and I'm not sure what to do about it. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed. I met Kimberly in Little Rock, Arkansas. She had been married for 20 years but was obviously troubled about her marriage. I think we are in the late stages of fall and getting close to winter, she said. What does it feel like to be in the fall season of marriage? I asked. Confusing, kind of scary, frustrating, burned out, and very stressful, she replied. She went on to describe the marriage and tell me what she thought had contributed to her feelings of distress. Her husband, who was listening to our conversation, did not offer any comments. When I looked at him and asked, what does it feel like to you? He had a one-word answer, bad. Marvin is 53 and has been married for 31 years. He described his emotions in the following way, I feel dejected, disheartened, and unappreciated. It's not a good place to be. I am not content with my marriage. Something has got to change or we're not going to make it. Marvin is in the late stages of fall. Winter will surely come if there are not significant changes. The encouraging note was that he said, I believe that my wife and I will both benefit from the seminar, and we have purchased a number of books that we intend to read. I hope they will help us refocus our relationship. Sometimes fall comes early in a marriage. Jackie and Charles had been married for 18 years, but they had an early onset of fall in their relationship, even though we got married in June, Jackie said. Charles began rejecting me the day we got married. He has had at least one affair that he has admitted. Last year, 
he went into a deep depression. Through all the talking and counseling, he was diagnosed with a depressive disorder and codependency. He has very negative feelings toward his mother, who is now deceased, and he took all those feelings out on me. It has been like an emotional roller coaster for 18 years. There have been some good moments, but mostly we have lived in fall. Only recently have I seen any hope. At least Charles was willing to go with me to a marriage seminar. And he has been willing to discuss a marriage book with me, so maybe there is hope. When I asked Charles, how do you feel about your marriage? He said, afraid, but hoping for improvement with God's help. I could cite numerous other examples of couples in the fall season of marriage, but perhaps these few are enough to give you a flavor of the emotions of fall, fear, sadness, rejection, and loneliness. These emotions may also be accompanied by feelings of dejection, a lack of appreciation, and resentment toward the spouse. Stephanie, who has been married for 19 years and has a debilitating disease, summarized the emotions of fall, I feel lonely, scared, uncertain, and frightened. I'm not sure how to handle all the emotions that come with overwhelming changes, a dire prognosis, and constant physical pain. We have not learned to handle our emotions together, so I am left alone, emotionally tired. The Attitudes of Fall The primary attitude of the fall season of marriage is one of great concern about the state of the marriage and uncertainty about where things are going. Most people do not want to be living in the fall season of marriage, therefore, they are concerned. They recognize that many changes are taking place, and they feel uncomfortable with what might be happening to their relationship. Ginger, who is 31 and has been married almost 7 years, said, I'm very uncertain about our relationship. I'm hoping that we have now put God at the center of our marriage, but I have never been so unsure about myself, my spouse, and our marriage. God is why we are still together and trying. I am not content with this season. We are currently in Christian counseling. Looking back, I realize we have never really spoken one another's love language. We read the book and learned about them, but we didn't effectively speak them. Then my husband had a five-month affair with a co-worker. He vehemently denied all my suspicions until he finally confessed. By the grace of God, we are still together and allowing God to work, reveal, and heal. In God's strength, we hope to finally become what he intended. Harriet has been married for 20 years. She lives in a small town outside Atlanta, Georgia. She said, many changes are taking place in our lives. Our oldest daughter is graduating from high school and will soon be leaving. Many years of our marriage have been centered around our children. We have realized that, somewhere along the way, all our focus has been on our children and not really on each other. What are we going to do? My husband, in filling out his survey, wrote, back quote we are in the summer season of our marriage. Do we live in the same world? Sometimes I wonder. I am very concerned about our marriage. Joan and Will have been married only eight months but describe their marriage as being in the fall season. Joan said, it is fearful. I would like for it to change. There is a lot of doubt as to where I fit into Will's life and whether or not he even loves me. His family was allowed to interfere during the first few months of our marriage, and trust was broken or never created. We are now trying to follow scripture's advice about backquote leaving parents and cleaving to each other, in order to restore our relationship. I pray daily for deliverance from my insecurities. We'll describe the marriage like this, I am greatly hopeful, but times are very trying. I know we will come out on top and lead a happy life, but currently we argue almost every day. We are learning how to love and care for each other. The Lord is helping us in this process. I am excited about what I have heard at the marriage seminar and hope we can put it into practice. We had a very rocky start, but we are learning more how to show our love for each other. I am hoping we can move from fall back into spring and begin to build our marriage on a solid foundation. If Will and Joan can turn these hopes into reality, they can discover spring again. Patrick and Tricia have been married for 19 years. Because he is in the military, they have lived in many different places. He says, our marriage has suffered late fall and early winter. This last year we have worked hard to recover, and we are digging our way out to head back to spring. My being sent to Iraq for a year showed both of us what we could lose. We are making progress by communicating, praying, and reading Christian books. I'm trying to become the spiritual leader of our family and show my wife how much I love her. His wife, Tricia, described the marriage like this, 
We are rebuilding our marriage after being apart because my husband was in Iraq for a year. It feels a little scary, but I know that we will grow closer, because throughout this year apart, we each drew closer to Christ. Only God could have healed a marriage like ours. Prior to Patrick's leaving to go to Iraq, we were eaten up with apathy and pride. It took his being away for me to appreciate him and to realize what a treasure the Lord has given me in him. Every day is one step closer to God's design for us as a married couple. Obviously, some of these couples have greater hope than others. All of them have a degree of uncertainty, all are greatly concerned about their marriage. Whether they move from fall to winter or from fall to spring will depend largely upon the actions they choose to take. The actions of fall. In this section, I want to address both the actions that lead couples into the fall season of marriage and the actions that lead them out. Without a doubt, the number one contributor to the fall season of marriage overwhelmingly is the action of neglect, or taking no action at all. The underlying assumption seems to be that the marriage will take care of itself. Husbands and wives have their own separate interests, and they forget to do the kinds of things that foster a positive marital relationship. Consequently, they grow slowly apart. They may be jolted into the reality that their marriage is in the fall season by some crisis, such as an extramarital affair, but the reality is that they were in the fall season for weeks and perhaps months before the crisis came. The leaves had changed color and were slowly falling from the branches, but they failed to recognize it because they were not in tune with each other. How they respond to the crisis will either push them into winter or lead them back toward spring. Over and over again, in the research that I did in preparation for this book, couples who described their marriages as being in the fall season echoed that neglecting each other was the central ingredient in creating the fall season. Kimberly from Little Rock, whom we met earlier in this chapter, described her feelings after 20 years of marriage as, confusing, kind of scary, frustrating, burned out, and very stressful. When I asked, what do you think brought you to this season of marriage? She replied, lack of communication, not spending time together, having nothing in common, leading separate lives. This led to substance abuse issues, unfaithfulness, lies, and lack of trust. It is interesting to note the progression of distance that developed between Kimberly and her husband, but it began with large-scale neglect. Marvin is the husband we met earlier who felt, dejected, disheartened, and unappreciated. In describing how he arrived in the fall season of marriage, he said, I think that the main problem has been lack of communication. We have been so busy having and raising our three children and making a living that we have not made time with each other a priority. Therefore, we grew apart. Mildred, who lives in Spokane, Washington, and has been married for 33 years, described her marriage as, not good. I know the marriage will remain and survive, but I want it to be tender and growing. The kids grew up, left home, and started their own families. When they left, my husband and I no longer had that common focus, we tended to do our own thing and grew apart. We simply neglected our relationship. Carol from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, echoed those sentiments, I have been married to my second husband for 12 years, and we have neglected to nurture our marriage. We have turned our attention totally to our children, ignoring each other's needs. In so doing, we have done ourselves and our children a disservice. The state of our marriage is a great disappointment. But I believe the foundation is still there. My husband is open, and we are trying to rebuild our relationship. Without question, neglect is what leads couples into the fall season of marriage. When a husband and wife allow the relationship to drift, they will always drift apart. When they drift apart, life becomes uncertain and scary. When couples realize they are in the fall season of marriage, they have a choice. They can take positive actions that lead back to spring or summer, or they can make destructive choices that lead to winter and possibly the death of the marriage. One of the actions that perpetuate fall or lead to winter is a failure to seek resolution of issues. Marty, from Fort Wayne, Indiana, illustrated this dilemma. We've been married for four years and I am very unhappy with our marriage. I just don't like John very much. I feel like I'm out of control and that is not familiar territory for me. He wants sex all the time, regardless of whether the kids are still awake or I'm right in the middle of cooking dinner. I need a few things to lead up to it. You know, kind words, a nice dinner, a quiet house. He doesn't care what else gets done around the house as long as we have sex. It was not this way from the beginning. I admit my response has been negative. 
I do not consciously withhold sex, but I realize that my resentment controls my actions. Sometimes we have gone months without sex. I'm not proud of that. I try to make conscious efforts to touch him, but he is never satisfied. I try to fill his love tank, but he never fills mine. I've been bitter, stubborn, and resentful. I know that something has got to change. Marty is exactly right. Something has got to change. Unresolved issues will keep couples in the fall season of marriage or, more likely, will lead them to winter. Sexual infidelity is another factor that has the potential to move a fall marriage to the winter season. As Emily, from Norfolk, Virginia, said, my heart is broken. After 37 years of marriage, I never dreamed we would ever be in this situation. This is my husband's second affair that I am aware of. This time it is more serious than before. He's a partner in a successful business, very active in the community, and a respected elected official in our county. But I find it hard to respect him. He is an only child and became very selfish. We have three married daughters and six grandchildren, with one on the way. He is willing to lose it all for a very aggressive woman. We have tried counseling together. After the first session, he would not go back because he did not like the counselor. The second counselor told us he was wasting our money because my husband showed no remorse, guilt, or shame for what he was doing. He is now in counseling alone, I think. I pray for him and her many times a day. They both say they are Christians, but words are cheap. I have had about all I can take, but I am still praying and hoping that he will be willing to work on our marriage. Emily's situation illustrates the reality that it takes both spouses to move a marriage from fall to spring, but it takes only one to move from fall to winter. The way we think and the actions we take make all the difference. The fall season of marriage is characterized by a sense of detaching. The leaves of our marriage are beginning to fall, and we are not certain what the future holds. It can be a very troubling time. Here is the summary of a fall marriage, making the most of fall. Couples are often in the early stages of fall before they realize it. They have been busy with the activities of summer, enjoying life but sometimes ignoring each other. As the color of the leaves begins to change, externally the marriages still look good. Couples are living in the afterglow of summer, but internally each partner is slowly disengaging. In the latter stage of fall the leaves are gone, and the emptiness of the relationship becomes apparent. It is this emotional emptiness that causes concern, uncertainty, and fearfulness. The dawning awareness of detachment often motivates one spouse or both to reach out for help. They may agree to attend a marriage seminar, seek the help of a counselor, or read and discuss a book about marriage. One young wife said, I never thought I'd come for counseling, but I am so concerned about what is happening in our marriage. I know we need help, and I don't want to wait until it's too late. The uncertainties of fall can prove redemptive if the couple turn in the right direction. Fall can lead directly into spring or a return to summer. On the other hand, if couples simply allow nature to take its course, they will inevitably wake up in winter. In the second part of this book, we will look at specific strategies for making the most of the fall season of marriage. Perhaps as you have read these introductory chapters, you have easily identified the season of your marriage. Or maybe you've had difficulty distinguishing between spring and summer or fall and winter. It is true that the late stages of fall and the early stages of winter are very similar. The same is true of the late stages of spring and the early stages of summer. But before we move on to discuss strategies for enhancing the seasons of your marriage, it is important for you to identify the season you're in. In the next chapter, you will find a seasonal profile that will help you make this determination. The marital seasons profile is not designed as a scientific instrument to force you into a seasonal category, rather, it is a communication tool to help you and your spouse take an honest look at your marriage. Whatever your conclusions about the season of your marriage, I think you will find the second part of the book extremely helpful in discovering or rediscovering the excitement of spring and the joys of summer. I hope you will also understand that the seasons of fall and winter are not altogether purposeless. They often serve as a wake-up call to stimulate marital growth. No marriage is hopeless. With the help of God, all things are possible. Marriage relationships are constantly changing. As we've seen, they go through identifiable seasons that may occur numerous times throughout the life of a marriage. That is, every couple will experience a succession of winters, summers, springs, and falls. 
The value of identifying the present season of your marriage is that it will help you become conscious of the present quality of your marriage and aware of the attitudes, emotions, and actions that characterize your relationship. Some of the seasons of marriage are more enjoyable and productive than others. Knowing the season of your marriage will allow you to take positive steps to maintain the joys of spring and summer and correct the negative behaviors that lead to fall and winter. If both you and your spouse are willing to take the profile, it can be a means for the two of you to honestly discuss the quality of your marriage and to take positive steps in stimulating marital growth. It is recommended that you take the profile individually without discussion until you have tabulated your results. The following pages include a profile score sheet for each spouse. Marital Seasons Indicator What season is your marriage in? Four words or phrases appear in each of the following 16 rows. Choose one word or phrase per row that best represents your thoughts and feelings about your marriage during the past few weeks. Once you have checked one word or phrase per row, tally each of the four columns by counting each check mark in that column as one point. You will have a score ranging from 0 to 16 for each of the four columns. Instructions for interpreting your scores can be found on the next page. Interpreting your scores. As you may have guessed, column 1 lists words and phrases that are typically used to describe the winter season of marriage. Column 2 represents spring. Column 3 represents summer. Column 4 represents fall. The column with the most points reflects the current season of your marriage. A close or equal score between two seasons suggests your marriage has elements of both seasons or may be in transition. The highest possible score for any season is 16. If you scored a 16, it indicates that your marriage is deep in that season. Do you agree with your scores? Are you surprised? On the next page, you'll find a second marital seasons indicator for your spouse to complete. Afterward, the two of you will be able to compare your answers and discuss what you each have contributed, either positive or negative, to bring you into this season. If you are in an enjoyable season, congratulations and keep up the good work. The second part of this book will teach you some strategies to keep your marriage growing and thriving. If you are not in an enjoyable season, don't give up. The strategies explained in part 2 will give you some practical steps you can take to improve your marriage. Regardless of the season of your marriage, there's hope and there's room for improvement. Commit yourself to work for the best possible marriage you can have. Marital Seasons Indicator for Your Spouse What season is your marriage in? Four words or phrases appear in each of the following 16 rows. Choose one word or phrase per row that best represents your thoughts and feelings about your marriage during the past few weeks. Once you have checked one word or phrase per row, tally each of the four columns by counting each check mark in that column as one point. You will have a score ranging from 0 to 16 for each of the four columns. Instructions for interpreting your scores can be found on the next page. Interpreting your scores. As you may have guessed, column 1 lists words and phrases that are typically used to describe the winter season of marriage. Column 2 represents spring. Column 3 represents summer. Column 4 represents fall. The column with the most points reflects the current season of your marriage. A close or equal score between two seasons suggests your marriage has elements of both seasons or may be in transition. The highest possible score for any season is 16. If you scored a 16, it indicates that your marriage is deep in that season. Do you agree with your scores? Are you surprised? Compare your answers with your spouse's answers and discuss what you each have contributed, either positive or negative, to bring you into this season. If you are in an enjoyable season, congratulations and keep up the good work. The second part of this book will teach you some strategies to keep your marriage growing and thriving. If you are not in an enjoyable season, don't give up. The strategies explained in part 2 will give you some practical steps you can take to improve your marriage. Regardless of the season of your marriage, there's hope and there's room for improvement. Commit yourself to work for the best possible marriage you can have. That we understand the characteristics of the four seasons of marriage, let's turn our attention to seven strategies that can move your marriage from the cold of winter to the warmth of summer, from the uncertainty of fall to the excitement of spring or enhance the quality of your marriage, regardless of season. These biblically-based strategies have grown out of my counseling experience over the past 30 years. I have seen numerous marriages turn in a positive direction by applying these ideas. They are not necessarily designed to be used in numerical order, 
Although dealing with past failures, strategy one often clears the debris in a relationship and paves the way for implementing the other strategies. Each strategy holds the potential to enhance the season of your marriage. I suggest that you read all seven strategies and then go back and select the one that seems the most appropriate to implement first. If your spouse is willing to join you, then what you learn and apply from the next seven chapters could be the beginning of a whole new way of relating to each other. If, on the other hand, your spouse wants nothing to do with that season's book, you may find strategy seven extremely valuable. If you are in the spring or summer season of marriage, these strategies will give you practical ideas for keeping your marriage alive and growing. If you are in the fall or winter season of marriage, these strategies can get your relationship moving toward a warmer, more pleasant season. Marriages either grow or they regress, they never stand still. Your attitudes and actions will affect your emotions as well as your spouse's. These strategies will challenge you to develop positive attitudes and actions that will greatly enhance the emotional climate of your marriage. Every married couple needs to understand this strategy, but couples in the fall or winter seasons of marriage will need to spend more time here identifying and processing past failures. Most of us can identify with Brent, who said, I know I have had failures in the past. Both of us have failed, but why can't we forget the past and focus on the present and the future? I am deeply empathetic with Brent's desire, but it doesn't work that way. We have to deal with the past before we can put it behind us. Otherwise, it keeps popping back up. But once we have resolved our past failures, we can spend our energy focusing on the present and create better seasons in the future. The strategy outlined in this chapter is one I have used with hundreds of couples through the years to help them deal realistically with past failures. I am confident that it will also work for you. Dealing with past failures involves three steps, identifying past failures, confession and repentance, and forgiveness. The first step may be the most difficult. Step 1. Identifying past failures. The first step in dealing with past failures is to identify them. When I shared this idea with Brent, he said, oh, I don't have any problem with that. Helen rehearses my failures every time we get into an argument. Perhaps, I said, but my guess is she doesn't list even 30% of your failures. No doubt her criticism irritates you. You're tired of hearing about your shortcomings, and you want her to forget about them. But the fact is you haven't done the hard work of identifying your own failures. Brent wasn't very happy with my initial approach, so he said, but what about her? Doesn't she have failures, too? Absolutely. I don't even know your wife yet but I'm certain she has had failures because she's human. But right now I'm talking to you, and you have expressed a desire that she would backquote forget the past and live in the present with a view to making the future better. I'm telling you how that can happen. And it begins with you. My straightforward approach with Brent was based on a discovery I've made in my years as a marriage counselor. The reality is that most of us can identify our spouse's failures much more readily than we can identify our own. Jesus described the problem in Matthew 7, 3-5. If we apply his teaching to marriage, it would sound like this, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your spouse's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your spouse's eye. When I read those verses to Brent's wife, Helen, several weeks later, she said, but that's not the way it is in our marriage. Brent doesn't have a speck in his eye, he has hundreds of logs. I know I'm not perfect, but he's the real problem in our marriage. Perhaps you are right, I said. However, because you are a follower of Jesus, would you be willing to start where Jesus told us to start namely, by dealing with your own failures? When she didn't immediately respond, I added, I'll commit myself to helping Brent deal with his failures if you will commit yourself to deal with your own. I'm willing to do that. Helen said, but I just want you to know where the real problem is. I let her statement pass without comment and said, okay, here is your assignment for this week, I want you to set aside two hours to get alone with God. Take your Bible, a notebook, and a pen or pencil, and I want you to pray a very biblical prayer. It is a prayer of David's, found in Psalm 139, 23-24. As you know, David had lots of failures in his life. Here is his prayer. Backquote search me, zero God, and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. 
Ask God to show you specific ways and times in which you have failed Brent over the past 17 years. You may even start with your courtship and engagement period, then move through the wedding, the honeymoon, the first year of your marriage, and so on. Ask God to bring to your mind the times when you spoke harshly to him or withdrew in silence, the times when you did hurtful things or treated him unkindly. As you listen to God, I want you to make a list of everything he brings to your mind. I want to warn you, though, that Satan will also try to speak to your mind. His message will go something like this, backquote well, certainly you were not kind, but that's because of what Brent did to you. That's not your fault. That doesn't count. Satan does not want you to be honest. He wants you to blame others for your own sinful behavior. Remember, Adam and Eve listened to Satan's voice. Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent. If we are going to deal with past failures, we must identify them and be willing to accept the responsibility for our own wrongful behavior. Helen indicated that she understood the assignment. However, she said, two hours is a long time. I don't think it will take that long. Don't short circuit the process, I cautioned. Set aside the two hours, and at least every 15 minutes ask God to show you more of your failures. Okay, she said, but I don't think it will take two hours. I sensed that Helen felt I was not dealing with the real problem, but she was willing to go along with my strategy. The following week Helen returned with her list. I found more things than I thought. But they are mainly little things, and I've asked God to forgive me. No, 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 I said. We're not ready for that. What do you mean? She asked. Aren't we supposed to confess our sins to God? Yes, but first we've got to identify them. Well, that's what I did, she said. No, no, no. You took the first step. This week I have another assignment. I want you to talk with each of your children individually. Tell them that you are working on your marriage. Tell them that you are trying to identify your failures in the marriage and that you want them to tell you of the times they remember when you spoke harshly to Brent, when you treated him unkindly and unfairly. Tell them that you want them to be totally truthful because you know you cannot work on your marriage if you are not honest. Then, I want you to go to your parents individually and ask them the same question. I understand that you and Brent have Sunday lunch with them once a month. Is that correct? Helen nodded. So they have had a fair amount of exposure to the two of you together. Ask them what they remember about times when they have heard you do or say things that were harsh or unloving to Brent. Then I want you to go to Brent's parents individually and make the same request. Helen was visibly irritated. I don't know where all of this is leading, and I don't know why I need to do all this, especially since Brent's failures are the real problem in our marriage. I can understand why you might be frustrated with my approach, I said, but let me remind you that I'm meeting with Brent every week and I'm giving him the same assignments I'm giving you. Marriage is a two-way street. Neither of you is perfect, and each of you must deal with your own failures. The first step is to identify those failures and take responsibility for them. To this point, neither you nor Brent has done this. However, it appears to me that now, for the first time in your lives, both of you are very serious about wanting to deal with the past failures in your marriage. And we are following a biblical pattern of beginning with our own failures. Helen took a deep breath and said, I know. You're right. We've got to deal with this. But bringing the kids in on this and my parents and his parents how can that be helpful? They are the people who know you best, I said and they are concerned about your marriage. In doing this, you are demonstrating to the children your sincerity and your honesty. And you are giving them a chance to voice what they have observed through the years about your behavior. Your parents and his parents will be glad to know that you are trying to deal with your part. And when Brent does his assignment, they will see that he is trying to deal with his part. God can use this process not only for your benefit but also for the benefit of your parents, your in-laws, and your children. There may be exceptions to the idea of consulting children, parents, and in-laws. For example, preschool children may be too young, dysfunctional parents or in-laws may be obsessively prejudiced and find it difficult to be objective. However you can best accomplish it in your own relationship, the point is to broaden your perspective beyond your own self-protective viewpoint. Often, hearing something from a child, a parent, or another close family member can really open our eyes to how we are treating our mate. Marriage doesn't operate in a vacuum. It affects everyone who is closely associated with a couple. 
I can assure you that you are likely to hear some things from your children and parents that you don't want to hear. Satan will tell you to defend yourself and say that what they are saying is not really the whole picture. He will want you to discount their testimony. Don't yield to that temptation. They are giving you good information. It is their perception of what they have observed about the way you have treated your spouse. Perhaps it was not your intention, but that's the way it came across to them. So accept what they say and put it on your list. When I gave Brenda this assignment, I said, I'm going to give you two weeks to do this, because it will take some time. Okay, but it's also going to be really hard. You're right, I agreed. It's never easy to ask those who know us best to give us honest feedback about our failures. It is very difficult but highly profitable. Before the two weeks were up, Helen called and asked for a one-week extension. When she came in the next time, however, she had completed the assignment thoroughly. I didn't know that my children and my parents and in-laws had observed so much about my behavior. I was shocked about some of the things they said and a little upset. But I remembered your challenge not to be defensive, so I wasn't. I listened and I wrote and I've got a pretty long list. I feel bad that the children picked up on my harshness to Brent through the years. In my mind, he deserved it. But I know it was not good for them to hear me talk to their father like I did. I could tell that Helen was beginning to identify and take responsibility for her failures. So what am I going to do with this list? She asked. I've already asked God to forgive me. That's fine, I said, but we're not quite ready for that. There's one more step. When we began this process, you told me that the real problem is Brent and not you. Remember, I have no reason to doubt what you said. So this week I want you to make a list of all the ways that Brent has hurt you through the years. There won't be enough paper, she said, laughing and crying at the same time. I nodded and offered her some encouragement. I know that you have been hurt through the years by Brent's actions. If that were not true, you would not be in my office for counseling. So I want to give you a chance to share these hurts with Brent but here is the spirit in which I want you to share them. I handed her a sheet of paper that had the following paragraph printed at the top. Dear Brent. I want to thank you for joining me in getting counseling for our marriage. As you know, Dr. Chapman has been helping us identify and take responsibility for our own failures. I can assure you that I have a pretty long list by now of ways in which I have failed you. This week we have been asked to make a list of the hurts we have experienced through the years. I know that many of these you have heard before because I tend to bring them up every time we get into an argument. I am writing this list not because I hate you but because I love you. And I want us to be able to put the past behind us so that we can build a better future. The first thing that comes to mind is. I asked Helen to read the paragraph and tell me if she agreed with it. When she responded positively, I said, now, I want you to write the first sentence sitting right here in the office. What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, chronologically, she said, it's when he forgot our first anniversary. But the most painful was when he had an emotional fling with a girl at the office. And which do you want to put first? I asked. I'll go chronologically. Okay, here's the way I want you to begin. You write as I talk. Number 1. Backquote I felt. Dot single quote. How would you describe your feelings when he forgot your first anniversary? Helen sat for a moment before beginning to write. When she finished, I read this sentence. I felt disappointed and deeply hurt on our first anniversary when the day came and went and you never mentioned it. I kept thinking you would surprise me with something, but you never did. As you remember, we ended up arguing half the night. I know I said some horrible things that night, but they grew out of my deep hurt. I couldn't believe you had forgotten the day we got married. Now, I said, I want you to begin each sentence with the words I felt and describe your feelings when Brent did something or said something or failed to do something or say something that hurt you. Don't preach to him. Just tell him how you felt about the event. You may list everything you remember. They don't have to be in chronological order, but I want your list to be as comprehensive as possible. This could take a long time, Helen said, laughing. That's fine, I responded. How many weeks do you want? I think two will be sufficient. All right, then I'll see you in two weeks. Two weeks later, I read through Helen's list of 35 painful experiences. I helped her rewrite two of them because she had started the sentence with you made me feel, rather than I felt. 
I reminded Helen that our purpose was not to condemn Brent but rather to inform him of her feelings. She had the list saved on her computer, so the revisions were not a major task. The next day, she dropped off her corrected list at my office. The following week, I gave Helen's list to Brent and Brent's list to Helen. Read the list as information from the heart of your spouse, I challenged both of them. I want you to sense what your spouse was feeling when these events occurred. I assume that your intention was not to hurt each other, but in reality both of you have experienced a great deal of pain. In dealing with the past, I want both of you to be aware of how your actions have hurt the other person. And I want you to take responsibility for that pain. Again, I don't mean that you intended to hurt your mate, but the reality is that he or she was deeply affected by your behavior. As you read through the list your spouse has given you, examine the list you made of your own failures to see if all your spouse's hurts are included on your list. If not, I want you to add them. The process of identifying past failures takes time and effort. It may also be painful. However, we cannot deal with past failures until we know what they are. Bringing family members into the process helps us see what others have observed about our behavior. We seldom see ourselves as others see us. Writing out our own pain from past experiences helps us identify why we are so hurt and angry. Sharing it with our spouse in written form makes it easier for him or her to sense our pain and not get defensive. Step 2. Confession and Repentance Once Brent and Helen had exchanged lists of hurts and had amended their own list of failures, they were ready for the second step in the strategy of dealing with past failures, confession and repentance, first to God and then to each other. I encouraged each of them to set aside another two hours to get alone with God, their Bible, and their lists. Begin by reading Psalm 51, I suggested. This is David's confession after he was confronted by Nathan the prophet and realized how deeply he had failed God and others. Let his prayer be a model for your own prayer. I want you to go through your list and confess each thing to God. The word confession means, to agree with. Therefore, when you confess your failures and admit that you have hurt your spouse, you are agreeing with God that you were wrong. You are agreeing that your behavior has caused pain to your spouse and has grieved God's heart. Repentance means, to turn around and walk in the opposite direction. By repenting of your failures and the hurt you've caused your spouse, you are expressing to God your desire to behave differently in the future. You are asking for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable you to love your spouse as God intends. Scripture says, if we confess our sins to God, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. When we confess our sins and repent, God is fully willing to forgive us. And He is able to forgive us because Christ has paid the penalty for our sin. Therefore, God can maintain His justice, yet still forgive the sinner, because Christ already paid the penalty, see Romans 5, 8-11. Having confessed and repented to God, Brent and Helen then were to do the same with each other. This next week, I said, spend two hours with each other going through the list of your own failures. Acknowledge to each other, line by line, that you were wrong and that you're sorry you hurt each other so deeply. And then ask for forgiveness. Don't rush through the list, I cautioned them. Take time with each item. Let your spouse hear you verbalize that you were wrong and that you feel bad that you hurt him or her so deeply. The second instruction I gave Helen and Brent was this, don't judge the other person's sincerity. We have different personalities. Some people, for example, cry more readily than others. Don't expect your spouse to exhibit the same body language that you do. He or she may be more stoic but just as sincere. Choose to receive your mate's words as a sincere, heartfelt confession and apology. Express your intention that, with the help of God, you hope to make things better in the future. Step 3. Forgiveness. Now Brent and Helen were ready for true forgiveness. In the scriptures, forgiveness is always the Christian response to confession and repentance. Jesus said, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him, Luke 17, 3. There is no place in the Christian life for an unforgiving spirit. In fact, Jesus taught that an unforgiving spirit is rebellion against God and must be confessed as sinful. I said to Brent and Helen, remember, forgiveness is not a feeling. It is a decision to lift the penalty for past failures and declare the spouse pardoned. Forgiveness does not mean that you will never think of the event again, nor does it mean that you will never feel the pain that accompanies the memory. 
Forgiveness does mean that you will no longer hold that failure or hurt against your spouse. As 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, love backquote keeps no record of wrongs. Forgiveness means that we don't bring up past failures. It means we recognize that Christ has already paid the penalty for our sins. When we have confessed and repented to God and to each other and God has forgiven us we choose to forgive each other. The strategy of dealing with past failures applies to all four seasons of marriage, because all of us have failures that need to be confessed and forgiven. Couples in the season of winter or fall may have huge storehouses of past failures that have never been processed. Couples in the season of spring or summer will need to deal with failures that occur as a part of the normal flow of life and not allow these to be stored and become a barrier to intimacy. The thought of dealing with past failures may strike terror in some individuals. I remember the husband who said, she hasn't mentioned it in six months, I'm hoping she's forgotten it. I certainly don't want to bring it up again myself. The fact that he was afraid to bring up the subject indicated it had never been fully confessed and forgiven. Whether his wife ever mentions it again or not, it is one of those underground yellow jackets that is likely to come out and sting him. I know that dealing with past failures will be really hard for some people, but the benefits of identification, confession, repentance, and forgiveness are so enormous that it will be worth the effort. If you're stuck here, consider these three benefits. Zero you will no longer fear the past because you have confessed your failures and have been forgiven. Zero your marriage relationship will be deepened when you and your spouse experience genuine confession, repentance, and forgiveness. Forgiveness makes possible the restoration of your marriage relationship. Makes possible the restoration of your marriage relationship. In forgiving others, you become more like Christ. In other words, dealing with past failures is a huge step towards spiritual maturity. Brent and Helen followed strategy one, a major step in moving from winter to spring. In fact, for the two of them, spring returned almost immediately, and they began making plans for a new future. I warned them, of course, that they were still not perfect and that one of them might revert to old patterns and bring up a past failure in the heat of anger. But when that happens, I said, recognize it as sinful behavior, confess it to God and to your spouse as quickly as possible, and ask forgiveness. I am often asked, what if my spouse is not willing to follow a strategy such as dealing with the past? I will answer that question more fully in strategy 7, but let me say briefly here that you can influence your spouse by your own behavior. When you choose to follow a biblical strategy, you will have a positive influence on your spouse. You cannot control your spouse's behavior, but you can and do greatly influence him or her by your own behavior. Following biblical strategies is the most powerful way to influence a non-participating spouse. Most athletes would agree that winning is 90% attitude and 10% hard work. If that is true in the world of sports, it is certainly also true in the world of relationships. Spring and summer marriages are created and sustained by positive attitudes. Fall and winter marriages are characterized by negative attitudes. What we think largely influences what we do. In turn, our actions greatly influence our emotions. This connection between attitude and actions opens a door of hope for all couples. If we can change our thinking, we can change the season of our marriage. The most common mistake couples make is allowing negative emotions to dictate their behavior. By failing to recognize the power of a positive attitude, they fail to achieve their marriage's highest potential. We have long recognized the power of a positive attitude in the business arena. Consider the attitudes of two different salespeople. One thinks, these people need a vacuum cleaner. I have the best one on the market and if I can show it to them, I know they will want it. And I can help them find a way to get it. The other one thinks, these people would not be interested in buying a vacuum cleaner. They have too many other things on their minds. Besides that, they couldn't afford one if they wanted it. Which salesperson is more likely to succeed? In this chapter I want to help you develop your potential for positive thinking, which will lead you to greater marital success. I must confess that I learned this strategy the hard way. Earlier in my marriage, I spent a great deal of time in the winter season because of my negative attitudes. And when I was in the midst of winter, I found it hard to admit that my attitude was part of the problem. It was much easier to blame Carolyn's behavior for our poor marriage. Today, I readily admit that my negative thinking was the culprit. If you are living in the fall or winter season of marriage, my guess is that you, 
Two, have the tendency to blame your spouse and are failing to recognize your own negative attitudes. If you want to break free from the coldness and bitterness of winter, I challenge you to devour the truth in this chapter. Changing your attitude can be a catalyst that sets in motion a seasonal change for your marriage. Circumstances are neutral or at least they're common. Therefore, it is not what happens to us but how we interpret what happens to us, our attitude, that makes the difference between success and failure. Let me show you the difference in the lives of two couples, Betsy and Kirk, and Charles and Kelly. Betsy and Kirk had been married 12 years when they experienced the death of their nine-year-old son. He was killed instantly by an automobile as he rode his bicycle from the driveway into the street. In my first conversation with Betsy, which occurred less than six hours after the accident, I discovered the seeds of blame. She said, I had just told Kirk last week that he needs to spend more time with Andrew talking with him about safety rules for riding his bicycle. If Kirk had talked with him, maybe this would not have happened. Later, in talking with Kirk, I sensed a similar attitude. I have never liked this place, he said. I told Betsy two years ago that I wanted us to get a little farm. I don't like raising kids in the city. It's too dangerous. I wish I had listened to my heart. Two months later, in another conversation, I found Kirk rehearsing the same message again. I just wish we would have moved to the farm two years ago. Betsy resisted the idea. She said it was so much more convenient in the city, but there is more to life than convenience. The following week I met with Betsy and found that she, too, had been playing the same message in her mind for two months. If only Kirk had talked to Andrew about safety rules, maybe Andrew would still be with us. Betsy was blaming Kirk, and Kirk was blaming Betsy. They would not have said it directly to one another, but their attitudes revealed the truth. I wish I could say that through counseling Kirk and Betsy changed their attitudes and found comfort and hope. The reality is that in less than a year they were separated and shortly thereafter divorced, creating additional pain for their other two sons, ages 5 and 7. Negative attitudes led to negative behavior, which ended in bitterness and divorce. Charles and Kelly experienced a very similar tragedy, but with very different results. Andrea, their seven-year-old daughter, drowned in the backyard pool while both parents were in the house. Charles and Kelly were planning to join Andrea for a swim, but she jumped in before they arrived. She was a good swimmer, Kelly said, and she had never gone into the pool without our being there. That was one of our rules. I don't know what happened. I had several sessions with Kelly and Charles over the next six months. Never once did I hear them blame each other, and never once did they blame Andrea. She was just being a child, Kelly said, with tears coursing down her cheeks. No need to blame her for breaking our buddy rule. It won't bring her back. Deeply pained, Charles and Kelly talked their way through their grief, gave each other the freedom to cry, held each other tenderly, and survived the ordeal with an even stronger marriage. We had a good marriage, Charles said. But the loss of Andrea has brought us even closer together. We know we can't bring her back, but we can go to be with her. We want to be good parents to our son and trust God with the future. In the years since Andrea's death, Charles and Kelly have gone on to live fruitful, productive lives. God gave them two additional children, whom they are rearing in a very nurturing home. The difference between the two couples was basically a difference in attitude. Both were deeply hurt, both suffered tragic loss. One couple chose an attitude of blame, whereas the other couple chose an attitude of acceptance and support. Attitude made all the difference. God gave us Andrea, and we had her for seven wonderful years, Charles said. She brought us great joy, and now she is in the presence of God. She loved Jesus. We loved her, and we know we will see her again someday. We know that she would not want us to sit around grieving her death for the next 20 years. As long as God gives us life, we want to be faithful in loving and caring for our other children and serving God. As Charles tried to summarize their attitude, Kelly was nodding her head affirmingly. Together they were demonstrating the power of a positive attitude in the midst of tragedy. A Christian worldview that is, a biblical perspective on life makes it much easier for couples to have a positive mental attitude. Perhaps you are asking, what is this backquote Christian worldview that fosters such a positive attitude? Let me mention some of the characteristics. Characteristics of a Christian worldview. Every human being is made in the image of God and is therefore extremely valuable. 
Each person is uniquely gifted by God, including the mentally and physically challenged. Each person has a unique role to play in life. Marriage is God's idea. Husbands and wives are intended to complement each other. The object of marriage is to glorify God by serving one's spouse and helping the spouse reach his or her God given potential. First is the recognition that every human being is made in the image of God and is therefore extremely valuable. Second, each person is uniquely gifted by God, including the mentally and physically challenged. Third, each person has a unique role to play in life. Fourth, marriage is God's idea. Thus, a man and a woman are uniquely created to work together as a team. Each has strengths and weaknesses. Each is called upon to complement the other. If they learn how to do this, they will accomplish more than they would ever have accomplished as individuals. Fifth, the goal of marriage is that husbands and wives voluntarily serve each other, helping each other reach their potential for God and promoting good in the world. When I meditate on these five truths, I am drawn to a positive attitude toward Carolyn, my wife. My attitude is not based on her behavior but on my beliefs about who she is and about my role in her life. Looking back on the various winter seasons of my marriage, I realized that my attitude during those times was not one of positive regard for Carolyn, instead, I focused on what I considered to be her weaknesses. Hurt or irritated by the things she said or left unsaid, annoyed by the things she did or failed to do, I found myself thinking the worst kind of thoughts about her and mentally blaming her for our poor relationship. In my counseling practice, I have since discovered how common that destructive pattern of thinking is. One example is Marilyn from Kansas City, who has been married to Bruce for 29 years. She indicated that she was definitely in a winter marriage. I feel unloved and angry, she said. How did you arrive at this season of marriage? I asked. We arrived here because of my husband's work. His job during parts of the year is demanding and requires lots of hours. So he is away from home most of the day. During these times, I become the head of the household, taking care of the boys and the finances. Also, he becomes distant and we don't have much communication. This has happened a lot during our 29 years of marriage, and I would like to stop the cycle. The good news is that Marilyn can stop the cycle. It begins by changing her attitude toward her husband. He is obviously a hard-working man, bringing home the bacon. And by Marilyn's own testimony, he has never been sexually unfaithful to her. These are admirable traits. But Bruce has obviously not met Marilyn's emotional need for love and companionship. That is why she considers her marriage to be in the winter season. Without realizing it, Marilyn has been sabotaging her Mar Ridge with a negative attitude. She has allowed the emotions of hurt, anger, and feelings of neglect to control her behavior toward Bruce. She has been verbally critical of him in the time he spends on the job, often saying such things as, you let the company take advantage of you. You don't make any extra money for all the hours you invest. You ought to demand that they pay you more. On other occasions, she has focused on his neglect of the children. How do you expect to have a positive influence on our boys when you don't spend any time with them? The fact that Bruce played ball with the boys every Sunday afternoon and sometimes took them on business trips with him was overlooked in Marilyn's verbal tirades. Bruce's attitude was also affected. I don't ever do anything right, he said. No matter what I do, it's never enough, so I've quit trying to please her. I tune her out when she gets into her long speeches. I just wish the boys didn't have to live in such a negative household. Bruce is also focusing on Marilyn's weaknesses and ignoring her strengths. The hours she spends tending to the household and helping the boys with homework are in the back of his mind, but what occupies his attention and guides his thinking or his focus on her angry lectures. All this could change if Bruce and Marilyn would choose a winning attitude. At the moment, they are continuing to perpetuate the winter season of marriage by their negative thinking toward each other. Breaking the cycle of negativity. What is involved in choosing a winning attitude? First, we must acknowledge our negative thinking. Most of us tend to rationalize and excuse our negative attitudes. We say, how do you expect me to react when they treat me like that? Or, as one woman said while pointing her finger at her husband in my counseling office, yes, I have a negative attitude, and there's a reason for it. He's sitting right there. As long as we rationalize our negative attitudes as legitimate, they will never change. If, however, we are tired of winter and would like to feel the hope of springtime again, we must recognize that our negative thinking must change. 
Our thinking guides our behavior. If we think negatively, we will behave in destructive ways. But if we think positively, our actions will be positive as well. The second step toward a winning attitude is identifying your spouse's positive characteristics. I suggest that you make a written list. Ask God to bring to your mind all the positive things about your spouse, and then write them down. Enlist the help of your children by saying something like this. I'm working on changing my attitude toward your father or mother and I'm trying to identify some of his positive traits. Would you tell me the things you like about your father, the things you appreciate and admire? I want to make a list. Not only will you get good feedback from your children, but you will also influence their thinking to turn in a positive direction. If your spouse has physically or verbally abused the children, you might preface your request by saying something like this, I know that you feel hurt by your father in many ways. So do I but I'm trying to change my attitude and give him credit for the positive contributions he makes to our lives. I need your help. With help from God and your kids, you will probably be able to make a fairly long list of your spouse's positive traits. However, even if the list is short, at least you have something positive on which to focus. One lady said about her husband, I have to say he's a good whistler. It irritates me at times, but I've never heard anyone whistle better than he does. I guess he must have grown up with the song backquote whistle while you work, because that is what he does all the time. The third step is to focus on those positive traits. Begin by thanking God for each one. If you are deeply hurt and want to recount to God your hurts before you give thanks, that's permissible. Your prayer might sound something like this. Dear God, you know how my husband or wife treats me. You know the pain, hurt, and anger I feel. But I thank you that he, she, is not all bad. Here are the things for which I want to give thanks. I thank you that he, she. Go through your list every day, thanking God for your spouse's positive characteristics. Ask God to turn your thinking toward the positive. Tell your spouse that you are tired of your negative, condemning messages toward him or her. Acknowledge that those negative speeches have not helped the situation and that you intend to stop them. A fourth step is to ask God to give you a biblical perspective of your spouse. Review the five characteristics of a Christian worldview listed on page 87 and begin to thank God for these five realities. Ask God to give you a new, positive attitude. Thank God that your spouse is made in the image of God and is therefore extremely valuable. Thank God that your spouse is uniquely gifted by God. Thank God that your spouse has a unique role to play in the kingdom of God. Thank God that marriage was his idea, and acknowledge that he gave you your marriage as a blessing, not as a curse. Thank God that you have the opportunity to serve your spouse and to help your spouse accomplish more of his or her potential in the kingdom of God. Begin to express verbal appreciation to your spouse for the positive things that you see. Set a goal, such as one compliment a week for the first month, then two compliments per week for the second month, then three per week the third month, and so on until you work up to at least a compliment a day. In the wisdom literature of the Bible, we read these words, the tongue has the power of life and death, Proverbs 18:21. You can give your marriage new life when you begin to express verbal appreciation to your spouse. When you replace condemnation and criticism with words of affirmation, something inside your spouse will begin to warm toward you. In due time, he or she will begin to think of you in a more positive light, and more positive behavior will soon follow. This is not manipulation, it is simply the natural result of feeling appreciated. Breaking the cycle of negativity Acknowledge your negative thinking. Identify and list your spouse's positive traits. Teach yourself to focus on your spouse's positive traits. 